Commandant of Auschwitz, the autobiography of Rudolf Hess, published by the World Publishing Company, Cleveland, Ohio. Li Library of Congress catalog, card number 60-5808, first edition. First published in Poland under the title Wspomnienia. Page 164. In the spring of 1942, the first transport of Jews, all earmarked for extermination, arrived in Upper Silesia. One of the first, if not the very first, of this was transport of Jews from Buten on February 15, 1942. They were taken from the, the training platform to the cottage, it meaning to the bunker one. Across the meadows where later building site two was located. The transport was conducted by Aumeyer and Palich and some of the block leaders. They talked with the Jews about general topics, inquiring concerning their qualification and trades, with a view to misleading them. On arrival at the cottage, they were told to undress. At first they went calmly into the rooms where they were supposed to be disinfected. But some of them showed sign of alarm and spoke of death and suffocation and annihilation. A sort of panic set in at once. Immediately all the Jews still outside were pushed into the chambers and the doors were screwed shut up. With the subsequent transports the difficult individuals were picked out early and most carefully supervised. At the first sign of unrest, those responsible were unobtrusively led behind the building and killed with a small caliber gun. That was inaudible to the others. The presence and calm behavior of the special detachment, this is the Sonderkommando, consisted of Jewish uh, prisoners served to reassure those who were worried or who suspected what was about to happen. A further calming effect was obtained by members of special detachment accompanying them into their rooms and remaining with them until the last moment, while an SS man also stood in the doorway until the end. It was most important that the whole business of arriving and undressing should take place in an atmosphere of greatest possible calm. People reluctant to take off their clothes had to be held by those of their companions who had already undressed or by men of special detachment. The refractory ones were calmed down and encouraged to undress. The prisoners of the special detachment also saw it that the process of undressing was carried out quickly, so that the victims would have little time to wonder what was happening. Page 165. The eager help given by the special detachment in encouraging them to undress and in, in, in conducting them into the gas chambers was most remarkable. I have never known nor heard of any of its members giving these people who were about to be gassed the slightest hint what lay ahead of them. On the contrary, they did everything in their power to deceive them and particularly to pacify the suspicious ones. Though they might refuse to believe the assessment, they had complete faith in those members of their own race and to reassure them and keep them calm, the special detachments, therefore always consisting of Jews, who themselves came from the same districts and did the people on whom a particular action was to be carried out. They would talk about life in the camp, and most of them asked for news of friends and relatives who had arrived in earlier transports. It was interesting to hear the lies that the special detachment told them without such conviction, and to see the emphatic gestures with all they underlined them. Many of the women hid the babies among the piles of clothing. The men of special detachment were particularly on the lookout for this and would speak words of encouragement to the woman until they had persuaded her to take the child with her.
The woman believed that the disinfectant might be bad for these smaller children, hence the effort to conceal them. The smaller children usually cried because of the strangeness of the being undressed in this fashion. But when the mothers or members of the special detachment comforted them, they became calm and entered gas chambers, playing or joking with one another and carrying their toys. I noticed that women who either guessed or knew what awaited them nevertheless found the courage to joke with the children to encourage them, despite, despite the mortal terror visible in their own eyes. One woman approached me as she walked past and pointing to the Hereford children who were manfully helping the smallest ones over the round ground, whispered, How can you bring my, yourself to kill such a beautiful, darling children? Have you no heart at all? Page 166. One old man, as he passed by me, hissed, Germany will pay a heavy penance for this mass murder of the Jews. His eye glowed with hatred as he said this. Nevertheless, he walked calmly into the gas chamber without worrying about the others. One young woman caught my attention, particularly as she ran busily hither and thither, helping the smallest children and the old woman to undress. During the selection, she had had two small children with her. And her agitated behavior and appearance had brought her to my notice at once. She did not look like, in the least like a Jewess. Now her children were no longer with her. She waited until the end, helping the women who were not undressed and who had several children with them, encouraging them and calming the children. She went with the very last ones into the gas chamber. Standing in the doorway, she said, I knew all the time that we were being brought to Auschwitz to be gassed. When the selection took place, I avoided being put with the able bodies ones, as I wished to look after the children. I wanted to go through it all, fully conscious of what was happening. I hope that will be quick. Goodbye. From time to time, women sh would suddenly give the most terrible shrieks while undressing, or tear their hair, or scream like maniacs. They were immediately led away behind the building and shot in the back of the neck with a small caliber weapon. It sometimes happened that as the men of the special detachment left the gas chamber, the women would suddenly realize what was happening and would call down every imaginable curse upon our heads. I remember too a woman who tried to throw her children out of the gas chamber just as the door was closing. Weeping, she called out, at least let my precious children live. There were many such shattering scenes which affected all who witnessed them. During the spring of 1942, hundreds of vigorous men and women Page 167. Walk all unsuspecting to their deaths in the gas chamber under the blossom laden fruit trees of the cottage orchard. This picture of death in the midst of life remains with me to this day. The process of selection which took place on the unloading platforms was in itself rich an incident. The breaking up of the families, the separation of men from the women and children, caused much agitation and spread anxiety through the whole transport. This was increased by the further separation from the others of those capable of work. Families wished at all costs to remain together. Those who had been selected ran back to rejoin their relation. Mothers with children tried to join their husbands and Old people attempted to find those of their children who had been selected for work and who had been led away. Often in the confusion was so great that the selections had to be begun all over again. The limited area of standing room did not permit better sorting arrangements. All attempts to pacify these agitated mobs were useless. It was often necessary to use force to restore order. 
As I have already frequently said, the Jews have strongly developed family feelings. They stick together like limpets. Nevertheless, according to my observation, they lack solidarity. One would have thought that in situations such as this, they would inevitably help and protect one another. But no, quite to the contrary. I have often known and heard all Jews, particularly from the Western Europe, who revealed the addresses of those members of the race still in hiding. One woman, already in gas chamber, shouted out to a non-commissioned officer the address of Jewish family. A man who judged by his clothes and deportment appeared to be of very good standing gave me, while actually undressing, a piece of paper on which was list of addresses of Dutch families who were hiding Jews. I do not know what induced these Jews to give such information. Was it a reason for personal revenge, or they were jealous that the others should survive? Page 168. The attitude of men of the special detachment was also strange. They were all well aware that once the actions were completed, they too would meet exactly the same fate as that suffered by those thousands of their own race. To those destruction they had contributed greatly. Yet the eagerness with which they carried out their duties never ceased to amaze me. Not only did they never divulge to the victims their impeding fate and were considerately helpful to, to them while they undressed, but they were also quite prepared to use violence on those who resisted. Then again, when it was a question of removing the troublemakers and holding them while they got shot, they would lead them out in such a way that victims never saw the non-commissioned officer standing there with the gun ready. And he was able to place it muzzle against the back of their necks without they noticing it. It was the same story when they dealt with sick and the invalids who could not be taken into the gas chambers. And it was all done in such a matter of course manner that they might themselves have been the exterminators. Then the bodies had to be taken from the gas chambers, and after the gold teeth had been extracted and the hair cut off, they had to be dragged to the pits of the crematorium. Then the fires in pits had to be stoked, the surplus fat drained off, and the mountains of burning corpses constantly turned over so that the drought might fan the flames. They carried out all this task with callous indifference, as though they were all part of the ordinary day's work. While they dragged the corpses out, they ate or they smoked. They did not stop eating even when they engaged on the grisly job of burning corpses, which had been lying for some time in mass graves. It had repeatedly that Jews of the special detachment would come upon the bodies of those relatives among the corpses and even among the living as they entered the gas chambers. They were obviously affected by this, but it never led to any incident. I myself saw a case of this sort. Once when bodies were being carried from a gas chamber to the fire pit, a man of special detachment suddenly stopped and stood for a moment as though rooted to the spot. Page 169. Then he continued to drag out the body with his comrades. I asked the capo what was up. He explained that the corpse was the Jew's wife. I watched him for a while but noticed nothing peculiar in his behavior. He continued to drag corpses along, just as he had done before. When I visited the detachment later, he was sitting with the others and eating, as though nothing had happened. He was really able to hide his emotions so completely, or had he become too brutalized to care even about this? Where did the Jews of the special detachment derive the strength to carry on night and day with their grisly work? 
Did they hope that some whim of fortune why might at least last moment snatch them from the jaws of death? Or had they become so duly dulled by the accumulation of horror that they were no longer capable even of ending their own lives and thus escaping from this existence? I have certainly watched them closely enough, but I have never really been able to get to the bottom of this behavior. It may be mentioned in this connection that the summer of 1944, a determined armed attempt to break out of Birkenau was made by Jewish Special Detachment, with the help of other prisoners from the women camp. The stores camp called Canada. It proved abortive, however, 455 prisoners and four SS non-commissioned officers were killed during this arm uprising. The Jews' way of living and of dying was a true riddle that I never managed to solve. All these experiences and incidents which I have described could be multiplied many times over. They, they are excerpts only taken from the whole vast business of extermination, sidelights as they were. The mass extermination with all these attendant circumstances did not, as I know, fail to affect those who took part in it. With very few exceptions, nearly all of these detained to do this monstrous work, this service, and who, like myself, have given sufficient thoughts to the matter, have been deeply marked by these events. Many of the men involved approached me as I went my runs through the extermination buildings and poured out the anxieties and impressions of me, in hope that all I could ally them. Again and again during this conversation, I was asked, is this really necessary we do all this? Is it necessary that hundreds of thousands of women and children be destroyed? And I, who in my innermost being had on countless occasions asked myself exactly this question, could only fob them off and attempt to console them by repeating that it was done on Hitler's order. I had to tell them that this extermination of Jewry had to be done, so that Germany and our posterity may be freed forever from the relentless adversaries. There was no doubt in the mind of any of us that Hitler's order had to be obeyed regardless, and that it was the duty of the SS to carry it out. Nevertheless, we were all tormented by secret doubts. I myself dare not admit to such doubts. In order to make my subordinates carry on the tasks, it was psychologically essential that myself appear convinced of the necessity for the gruesome, harsh order. Everyone watched me. They observed the impression produced upon me by the kind of scenes that I have described above and my reactions. Every word I said of the subject was discussed. I had to exercise intense self-control in order to prevent my innermost doubts and feelings of oppression from becoming apparent.